Welcome. 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 Welcome to Church Online. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to Online Church. Welcome to Church Online. Welcome to Church Online. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to Online Church. Welcome to Church Online. Welcome. 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 Welcome to Church Online. Welcome to Church Online. Welcome to Church Online. Welcome to Church Online. Welcome. Welcome to Church Online. Welcome. Welcome, eh? To Church Online, eh? Welcome. Welcome all the mouth. Welcome back Church Online.
Hi everyone, it's Virginia, Community Care Pastor. We know that as human beings made in the image of God that we long for connection. Church Online has been one way that we've been able to stay connected. It's been interesting to me to hear from you the different elements of the service that have been important for that connection. For some, it's just watching the service, that's enough. For others, the chat search section is really important. For others still, it's standing during the worship time so that you feel like you're standing alongside those people in the auditorium each Sunday as we meet together. As a church during these times, we wanna make sure there's lots of ways that we can connect. So take a look at the connect button on the Church Online page. It's the third button along in the top right hand corner of the page. Press that and you'll find lots of options. You can simply fill in your contact details and add a message and send. Or you can select an option from the drop down menu. Whether you're a regular or you've become a regular through Church Online, we want to connect with you. We want to hear from you and see what, what more we can offer. Check it out, get in touch, let's connect. Good evening. I was once the chief servant of Master Abraham. Let me tell you a story about how we found a lovely bride for young Isaac. Ah, well done, my boy. You're getting better and better. Dear servant, would you come over here, please? I'm now old and getting on in my years, so it's time to find a wife for my son. Master, have you heard of Crystal Singles Facebook? Whoa! Nah. I want you to take ten camels and head northwest towards Mesopotamia. Please, do your best. Yes, Master. My master Abraham, please give me success today. When the daughters of the townspeople come out to draw water from the well, and when I ask, please water for me also, may they say yes and for your camels as well. For then I will know she is the one that you have chosen for young Isaac. Please, may I have some water from your jug? Of course, my lord, drink. My name's Rebecca, but a lot of people call me Beck. Oh, let me draw some water for your camels too. Yep, that was a miracle. God had prepared Rebecca to be Isaac's bride and their children will continue the line of Abraham. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. Rebecca and Isaac had trouble conceiving. After many years of waiting, God answered their prayers and Rebecca fell pregnant. Look, Beck's about to have a baby. Come on, you can do this, you can do this. Look, they're twins, two boys. What should we name them? Esau. Jacob. I have a feeling these two boys will be the best brothers ever. Welcome back, Northern Life Kids. What an interesting story about how Isaac and Rebecca were paired up. It's not common to have a servant go out and pick the right partner for you, but it was important in Isaac's case because he was integral to the covenant God made with Abraham. Back in Genesis chapter 12, God made a promise that he'll bless all nations through Abraham. God was referring to Jesus and the work he'll do on the cross. You see, Genesis chapters 3 to 11 shows us that sin is an ongoing problem and humans can never save themselves. So God shows us his great saving plan, which began from Abraham. Abraham had a son called Isaac and Isaac had a son called Jacob. Eventually, Jesus came into the world and defeated sin. Evil doesn't get the last say. Jesus is king and reigns forever. We're going to receive our offering now. If you're someone who already gives online, thank you so much for supporting the gospel work here at Northern Life. 
If you'd like to give and you're not sure how, there's a button that says give, click that and follow the prompts. To say that what we're about to attempt is audacious is probably an understatement. In the next little while, we're going to try to work our way through the entire book of Revelation. Now, if you want an excellent overview of the book, be sure to check out a website called The Bible Project. There are some wonderful resources around these days to help us understand our Bibles. I guess you just have to know where to find them, and that is one excellent resource, The Bible Project. Revelation is written by John, most probably the John who Jesus loved and who was exiled on the island of Patmos, just off the coast of modern-day Turkey. John begins his letter by saying that it is a revelation, or in Greek, an apocalypse. Apocalyptic is a type of literature, uh, a genre that people of the first century would be familiar with. He also says that it is a prophecy in verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Apocalyptic prophecy recounts a symbolic vision given by God to the prophet that reveals God's heavenly perspective on history so that the present can be understood in light of that bigger view. Revelation is a hotly debated book of the Bible. For the best part of 2,000 years, people have argued what certain symbols and numbers and characters mean. I'm going to try to avoid running too hard with any one camp's flag. I know that's basically impossible. Hopefully I can keep a pretty much middle-of-the-road approach. We'll see how that fares. I say that simply to forewarn you that if you have a very neat historic premillennial position and you disagree with some of this teaching, I hope we can agree on the big details about what Revelation is trying to communicate to us here in the 21st century. Revelation is a letter written initially to seven real churches in Asia Minor, what we now know as Turkey. Seven churches who were filled with people undergoing genuine challenges to hold on to their faith. Some of these churches are growing apathetic in their love of Christ. Others are becoming materialistic. Others are slipping back into immorality And some are experiencing fierce persecution. The Roman Emperor Nero had done terrible things to Christians. Now it's most likely Emperor Domitian who is doing it. You can read about what Jesus says to each church from Revelation 1.9 to Revelation 3.22. Before the book reveals Jesus' words to each of the churches, we're told very importantly in Revelation 1.20 that the seven churches are represented by seven lampstands. Revelation 1.20, the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This will be an important symbol to remember for the rest of the book. Lampstand equals churches. This section concludes with these words of Jesus from chapter 3, verse 20. Revelation 3.20. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice... And opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, Jesus says actually in the Greek language, to the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me. Conquers, nikau in Greek. To the one who conquers the persecution, the apathy, the worldliness, the pressure to not remain faithful as a follower of Jesus, I will give, Jesus says, the right to be with me forever. Now this is a little weird because if you know evangelical doctrine, we're saved by grace and and, and many would say we just rest in that grace and, and let grace lead us home. Here it seems like we're seeing the other side of the coin. There is a grace-fueled obedience which is required of followers of Jesus. It's sometimes referred to as the perseverance of the saints. Being a Christian involves remaining true to one's beliefs to the end. The book of Revelation is built around this big question. 
Will God's people remain faithful to Christ? In other words, will they conquer the temptations of the world or will they compromise? Conquer or compromise? The reward for conquering is found in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. You could skip ahead and see how things end up. All the chapters in between tell the story of how we get there. We looked at chapters 4 and 5 in detail last week. John is taken into the throne room of God and we're introduced to a God who is absolutely glorious and he is surrounded by beings who are glorious also and and everyone is worshipping the one true living God. They never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And then we're told that There is a scroll in God's right hand, which means it's under his authority, the right hand. And it has seven seals on it, on this scroll, like an ancient writing seal that uh, closes up a scroll. But nobody can open the seals to open the scroll. The scroll contains the history of the world. It unveils what will happen in God's future. No one is worthy among humanity to open the scroll. And John weeps. It's profoundly disturbing for him. No human being is worthy. No one who has ever lived is sufficiently righteous to do the job. Revelation 5.5 5 says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the centre of the throne. John hears the sound of an angel describe the line of the tribe of Judah, an Old Testament picture of the Messiah, the great military leader, who would rescue the people of Israel. But when he looks, what he sees doesn't look like a lion. He sees a lamb. And not just a lamb, he sees a lamb who has been slain. The lamb is Jesus, who died on the cross. As the spotless sacrifice for our sin. He lived a perfect life so that he could pay the ultimate sacrifice to die in our place, bearing our sin on him. He took what we deserved. The lamb provided for Abraham to save his son Isaac. The lamb's blood provided to spare the people of Israel when the angel of the Lord killed the firstborn sons in Egypt. It was all a picture of the true lamb of God who would come and pay for the sin of the world. And his name is Jesus. The strange thing about the lamb is that he is victorious over evil by letting evil kill him. The lamb conquers in this inverted kingdom way by giving his life in self-sacrifice. He conquers sin and death and evil by apparently being conquered himself. The lamb is worthy and the heavenly court sing to his glory. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. So that's where we've come to so far in this teaching series. Now things get a little weird. Chapter 6, we are introduced to seven seals to be opened on the scroll, and seven trumpets, and seven signs, and seven bowls, and two beasts, and a dragon. So where do we begin? Well, let's start with how we should read the next chapters. A sure recipe for confusion is to open your Bible with a notepad and pen and start reading, as I did again recently, and try to make linear sense of the next 10 chapters. It's a little frustrating, to be honest, because it feels like you're going around in circles. John is telling you stuff that you've just read, which is happening all over again. It's like you're unpacking a nesting doll, a babushka doll. Inside each doll is another doll. It's sort of... It's, it just doesn't seem to make sense until you catch on to the fact that he is actually describing the same period of history between the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his return and final judgment. The seven seals tell the story from resurrection to the end. The seven trumpets tell the same story but from a different perspective. The seven signs flesh it all out. The seven bowls give yet another perspective of the same period of history. Chapters 6 to 16 of Revelation are the story of humanity and our struggle with the forces of evil and our struggle with our own bent towards building towers of Babel for our own glory. So let's start in chapter (coughs) 6 with the beginning of the seven seals, Revelation 6.11. I watched as the Lamb opened the first 
of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. If we kept reading about the seven seals, we find a direct connection to the horsemen of Zechariah chapter 1. The horsemen bring war and conquest and famine and death. To be honest, a tragically average day in human history. Then the fifth seal tells us about the Christian martyrs. Revelation 6.10, they cry out, How long, Lord? Many will die as they make their stand against compromising with the world. John writes, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? This is the sixth seal and it's describing the end of the world, what John calls the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is an idea that came from the Passover back in Exodus when God rescued his people from Egypt. Each year Israel would celebrate Passover And call it the day of the Lord, the day when God judged Israel's oppressors and set them free. Over time, (coughs) over time for the people of Israel, the day of the Lord represented divine judgment on the enemies of God. So here in the first revelation of sevens describing the end of the world, we're told about a cosmic calamity. It sounds like the, the end of the world that most of us may imagine. An asteroid shower hits us, global warming takes its toll However it happens, it's global, it's all-encompassing. If we were to summarise history between the resurrection and the return of Christ, there are many times of divine judgement, opportunities for people to repent, there is persecution of Jesus' followers, and a final day of the Lord. Later it will be described as a battle. In Revelation 6.17, John says, For the great day of their wrath has come, And who can withstand it? Who can withstand it? How could a human being be safe when the day of the Lord comes? John delves into this idea to explain in chapter 7, verse 4. We're told again that that John hears something that grabs his attention. He he hears the number of 144,000. It's an obvious clue to think of Numbers, chapter 1 in the Old Testament, when there is a military census of the 12 tribes of Israel. John hears the number and expects to look and see a grand and imposing army. But when he looks, he sees not a great army. He sees a multi-ethnic community who are worshipping the Lamb. Revelation 7.9 says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The people of God are the people of the Lamb. Now they are called to overcome, to conquer in the same way that the Lamb conquers by giving their lives away in sacrificial love. Chapter 8, 1 to 5 gives us one perspective, that of the seven seals of the end of the world. The seventh seal is opened and seven trumpets are given to the seven angels. And in the presence of the redeemed who are praying and worshipping, the angel of the Lord sends fire to the earth to finish it off completely. 
Revelation 8, 4. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it on the earth and there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. But what about those seven trumpets? John is ready to give us another perspective on the time period between Christ's resurrection and his return, the final judgment. The trumpets take us from Revelation 8.6 right through to 11.19. This time the end is described with imagery taken from the plagues of Egypt. Four trumpets have plagues sent upon the earth. A fifth releases a demon locust swarm, whatever that means. And the sixth releases the horsemen, the four horsemen. Remember, it's a, a different perspective of the same events. The key scripture in this section is found in Revelation 9.20. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshipping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality or their thefts. It seems that John is being told in the Revelation that people don't tend to repent when facing God's judgment alone. All these terrible visitations of judgment upon humanity, and yet people refuse to repent until they are shown the love of the people of the Lamb. And this is what John unpacks in chapter 10 and 11. The seventh trumpet is not sounded until John explains what's going on throughout the sixth trumpet. Chapter 10 tells us that another angel brings John a little scroll. And tells him to eat it. Like Ezekiel, the prophet, was told to eat a prophetic scroll in the Old Testament. John eats it and starts prophesying. And again, this is where things start getting trippy um, once more. Chapter 11 introduces us to two witnesses. Verse 3 of chapter 11. And I will appoint my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees. And the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. Now, these two witnesses are often believed to be two literal figures, two prophets who have either already lived or will live in the future. What's helpful to notice is that John calls them lampstands. Now, what do we know about lampstands in the book of Revelation? They represent the church. So John is probably referring more generally to the church's witness in the last days, a prophetic declaration of the eternal gospel to all the world that resembles Moses and Elijah of the Old Testament. The church will testify to the glory of the Lamb, but a beast will emerge who will slay the witnesses. Verse, 11 of 11, uh, verse 7 of chapter 11. Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. So a beast has killed the witnesses. But after a period of time, the witnesses come alive again. And Revelation 10, 13 says, Many gave glory to God. So as the church gives their lives away in lamb-like, courageous, sacrificial love and testimony, people turn back to God. The seventh trumpet sounds and the hallelujah chorus gets sung. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Remember, same period, different perspective. The church are called to live as the Lamb lived, and they will overcome. They will conquer. But who is this beast? Before we get to it, you look like you need a short breather. Take a moment to listen to this beautiful song, and then we'll come back and wrap up Revelation. So 
firm in his foundation. No power can overthrow. And he shall reign forever and ever. And he shall reign forever and ever. One name outlasts the ages through time is truth revealed while kings may pass like shadows To the Lamb upon the throne, hallelujah, hallelujah, to the Lord forevermore, hallelujah. The church's mission. The church will conquer the nations when we love like the Lamb loved, dying to ourselves, which is the essence of Christianity. 
dying for others. It's God's mercy shown through the people of God that will ultimately bring the nations to repentance. Chapters 12 to 14. John stops the drumbeat of sevens and takes a moment to explain some of these symbols. There's a supernatural battle going on in this world. You know that. I I know that. There's more going on than that which we can see with our eyes alone. Chapter 12, 1 to 11, tells us about the dragon. We're taken all the way back to Genesis 3.15, the serpent, the evil one, the devil, who has always been against the good plans of God. Chapter 12, verse 1, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. Here's where you can run with any manner of theory about what this means. I want to suggest to you that the woman represents Christ, and he gives birth to the church. And the dragon wants to destroy both the woman and the child. Christ and his church. Verse 9 says the dragon is the evil one. He wages war against the offspring of the woman, verse 17. But he is defeated, verse 11, through the blood of the lamb. Verse 11 says they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. John's point is this. We battle not against flesh and blood. Rather, it's a spiritual battle in the heavenly realms, as Paul says in Ephesians. The seven churches of chapters 1 to 3 are struggling to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus under the persecution that is coming their way, the temptations of the flesh. It's not just flesh, John is saying. It's spiritual. We have a spiritual enemy. The dragon is behind it all. But immediately in chapter 13, the revelation informs John that the struggle of the churches to conquer and overcome is not just off in the spiritual realms. realms. It's intensely tangible. It's real now. Chapter 13 describes two beasts. Remember the beast we were introduced to with the trumpets? Now we find there are two beasts. And once again, depending on your method of interpretation, you might see these as individuals who have lived or will live. But what is more generally obvious is that the first beast has enormous military power and the second beast has great economic power. They represent human society, human governments with power, both military and economic that force people to come under their regimes. We're told that the beast has a number. Verse 16. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man That number is 666, another one of the more hotly debated parts of Revelation. But actually, it probably shouldn't be as confusing as it seems. The mark is the anti-Shema. The Shema is the most holy prayer for a Jew. It's the prayer of allegiance to God found in Deuteronomy 6, 4-8. And it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, And with all your soul and with all your strength, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. The beast is saying, you must give your allegiance to the systems of the world, not to God to the powers of the world, not to God. Hebrew letters correspond with numbers. The first ten letters of the alphabet are worth one each. 
The next 10 are 10 each, and then 100 each for each letter to the end. If you write the name Nero Caesar in Hebrew and look at its numerical value, guess what? It's 666. Nero represented the current iteration of the beast, the anti-god power that exalted itself and made people use coinage which, with the mark of the emperor to allow you to exchange money to buy goods to survive. The mark of the beast most probably represents any power that sets itself up as having all power and demanding allegiance. Daniel explains it all in his prophecy 500 years before Christ. They saw Babylon behave like this, then Persia, <clears throat> then Greece, then Rome. And we've seen dozens of powers come and go in the next 2,000 years. In opposition to the system of the beast, John sees, Then I looked and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. From every tribe. And every nation will come a community of Jesus' followers who refuse to come under the beast. They refuse to come under the way of the world. They remain in the way of the master, the way of love. Chapter 14 ends with another very scary description of judgment where those who are not found belonging to the Lamb come under the terrible wrath of God. John is leaving the seven churches with a choice. Will they remain faithful to Jesus? Or will they compromise and suffer the consequences? Have you ever felt like you are being taken along by the tide, by the flow of life's river? And it's taking you more and more towards worldliness, more towards self and sin than towards God? That would be the system of the beast. The world is actively leading people away from the life of the Lamb's conquerors. Chapter 15 and 16 repeats a different perspective, this time with seven bowls containing plagues. Verse 16, 9 tells us, but they refused to repent and glorify him. It's a, a common theme in human history. Even after severe judgment from God, people refuse to repent. The sixth bowl introduces the idea of a final battle at a place called Armageddon. 16, 16. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now, some see this as a literal battle, and it could well be, but we're, we know, we're told, what happens in the end in general. This is the end of the world as we know it. Verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on the earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds, fell on people. And they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. Revelation finishes with three scenes where John is given further details. Obviously, we don't have time to spend very long on each section. But chapters 17 to 19 show a woman who is drunk and riding on top of the dragon. She's intoxicated with power and evil, and she represents Babylon, which represents every beastly human power that sets itself up against the glory of God. In the first century, this is clearly referring to Rome, but Rome is just a type of every nation that will follow. The message is clear. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. Babylon will fall. The powerful systems of the world will fail 
and will ultimately come under the judgment of God. Heaven rejoices over Babylon's fall in chapter 19. Chapters 19 and 20 delve deeper into the final battle, the Armageddon battle. The sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, the seventh bowl all deal with how evil is defeated. So this is super important to take in. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. His, he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen white and clean coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations he will rule them with an iron scepter he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of god almighty on his robe and on his thigh he has this name written king of kings and lord of lords it's jesus coming in battle it's a description of armageddon <clears throat> but what is different about this military leader his robe is already bloodied before the battle. And the sword is not by his side, it's coming out of his mouth. This is the conquering lamb of God who still wins by shedding his own blood. The once and for all shed blood of his cross. This is not going to be a bloodbath of a battle because the lamb has already been slain. He has conquered the dragon and the world and sin and death because he died and rose again. He wins because he's speaks the truth. He is the truth. He is the unchanging word of God. Out of his mouth comes the judgment on the nations. He says it. That's enough. It's done. There is no real battle. This is the word of God. Chapter 20, the martyrs are vindicated. Satan is finally judged and quarantined in the lake of fire with all who have not been forgiven and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And what is left? but the marriage of the Lamb. Chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and for the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end to the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this and I will be their God and they will be my children. The lamb will have a bride and it is his church. And the Garden of Eden is restored and, and yet more. Now there's a thriving city, a new Jerusalem on a new earth. There's no more temple for God is with his people by his spirit. Hallelujah. Revelation 22, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. The reward for those who refuse compromise, who stay in the grace of God, who remain in Christ. The reward for the seven churches we started with. The reward for those who are found in the conquering lamb. The, re the reward for those who repent and receive the forgiveness available through the mercy of Jesus, through his death and resurrection, is eternal life with God in a new creation 
with forever to understand and enjoy it all. You can know and love God. And it doesn't have to end. Hallelujah. You can live with God. So can I forever. It's available to us to receive by faith. Revelation 22 says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, what an awesome God you are. And Lord Jesus, you are worthy of our praise. As we have studied Revelation, we are reminded so clearly of our own sin and failure and limitation. Lord Jesus, we need a saviour and you are that saviour. Thank you for the invitation to come and find life, eternal life, a relationship with the Father, filled with your spirit, a new identity and a hope that can never fail. Lord God, when you bring justice, it will be righteous. Lord Jesus, would you return, wrap this up, that the pain and sin might end and that you might receive your bride. I don't know where you are at with God. Um, God is not looking for perfect people. <clears throat> He's looking for humble people who will literally fall at their knees before him and say, have mercy. I believe, Jesus, you died for me. That's enough. I believe you rose from the dead and conquered sin, death and the devil. I, I, I want in. I want into the kingdom. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe Jesus died and rose again and confess your allegiance to him and the Bible says you will be saved. I pray that's what you will experience. And for those of us who are already Christians, may we, may we conquer by the grace of God. In Jesus' name.
and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I believe you are the way the truth the life I believe you are the way the truth Thanks for joining us for Worship Together Online. If you would like prayer right now, please just ask for it. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. Hope to see you next week. Stay.